start of July, right? Yeah. Or is it July? July 3rd? Yeah, I believe it's Juarez. This is, I could be wherever, this is where I was. Although I would like to scoot over
We are. We are. We are Common Ground. We are a congregation that is a family of churches that meets in three locations across Indianapolis. Here at Common Ground Northeast, we believe the Holy Spirit has empowered all believers to bring people of every age, every age background, every age background, culture, every age, background, culture, and ethnicity together. To be formed in the image of Jesus. To best love our neighbors in, in Indianapolis and around the world. We are glad you chose to be with us today. And worship with our family. We are. We are. We are Common Ground. We are a congregation that is a family of churches that meets in three locations across Indianapolis. Here at Common Ground Northeast, we believe the Holy Spirit has empowered all believers to bring people of every age, every age background, every age background, culture, every age background, culture, and ethnicity together to be formed in the image of Jesus to best love our neighbors in, in Indianapolis and around the world. We are glad you chose to be with us today and worship with our family.
Hey, good morning and welcome to Common Ground. Would you guys join us in our time of worship? I give you my worship. You still deserve it. You're worthy. You're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy of my soul. I pour out your praises. Come blessing and break it. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my soul. That's changing. Oh, I'm gonna worship till I meet every word. Cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. Come on, I give you my worship. I give you my worship. You still deserve it. You're worthy. You're worthy, you're worthy of my song. I pour out your praises, your blessing and break it. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song. Yes, you are God. You're worthy, you're worthy of my 
song I give you my worship You still deserve it You're worthy You're worthy You're worthy of my song I pour out your praises And bless you and break it You're worthy You're worthy Jesus, you're worthy of my song You're worthy You're worthy Jesus, you're worthy of my soul. You're worthy, you're worthy. Forever worthy of my soul. You're worthy, oh, you're worthy. So as we're singing this song, and I know it's a new song, but I love it when songs get that particular, right? If you've ever been in a situation where somebody was in a hospital bed and they couldn't get up or somebody couldn't lift their head, there's a beauty in that kind of understanding and specificity, <laughs> I guess. Did I say that word right? I might have made that word up just now. But this idea where if you're in that moment, it identifies so powerfully with you. But if you haven't been in that moment, you get to pray for somebody who might be in that situation. And so we lift up God's worth in the middle of times when things are difficult or when we're struggling, but also in times of praise and celebration. If you couldn't tell behind me, we are celebrating today our VBS this last week. These are the waves that were up here. As we are making ways with our kids, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more. Jody will come up and give a little bit more uh, behind the scenes on that, and we're going to have you all join us in song as we uh, sing and do some dancing here with our kids throughout the week. Well, my name is Eric Thien. I'm the lead pastor here at Common Ground Northeast. It's good to have you all here. It's a nice enough day. People are filtering in um, here from the outside. Uh, I wanted to make a mention, if you're new and you're joining us online, I know there's people who are watching online right now. Um, and those who are here in person for the first time. We would love to get connected with you. Um, and so if you could, in person, we have these little connect cards, the red ones in the seat back organizer in front of you. You can go ahead and fill one of those out and we'll be able to follow up with you. If you're online, somebody should be dropping a link inside of the chat right now for you and you can just click that and follow it through and give us some information. We'd love to partner with you as you're walking forward in your journey with Christ wherever you're at um, and to be uh, assistance and serve you in some way as we minister um, in the midst of that. Um, um, for our announcements this morning, there's uh, just a couple of mentions I wanted to make. As always, we want to point you to our online um, church bulletin. Um, it's all digital. You can use the little QR code on the seatback organizer in front of you. You can go online and hit the little menu at the top right and just go to ch digital bulletin, and all the details will be there for that. Um, but the big one that's on there next is that after service today, does anyone know what we got coming? Anyone? <laughs> all the kids... We have an ice cream social. Um, if you haven't had a chance to meet Minister Wade, I know we brought him up here and introduced him. He's been doing some of our um, uh, food hospitality, and he's got an ice cream social that he has organized for us. We'll be doing that outside. We'll remind you before you leave, but something tells me I won't need to do too many reminders for that one. Um, we also have some things coming up in our youth calendar. If you've got that, that's its own calendar um, for Edge Week on the 7th through 9th of July. Um, and then uh, if you are new and you're interested in learning more about Common Ground, on 724, so July 24th, we have a CG DNA. That's a newcomer's class right after service. We do try to provide food, pizza, or something like that on the other side. Um, but feel free to come and check that out um, if you're checking Common Ground out just for the first time or just want to learn more about our history, what we kind of plan to do with our church here moving forward in the future. Well, um, we do have a quick little... Uh, 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 VBS update, but before we do that, what I want to do is just make a quick little moment of time where we stop and say hello to someone, a quick meet and greet. So if you wouldn't mind, just go ahead and stand up, wander around, say hi to someone. Maybe if you haven't seen them before, welcome them here to Common Ground Northeast.
Good morning, everyone. If you could head back to your seats. So glad to see so many of you this morning. Well, I am Pastor Jody, and I had the honor and privilege of directing VBS this past week. We had a little over 40 kids participate. About a dozen of those were kids from other churches um, and from the neighborhood, friends of friends. So we were really excited to have everyone. Our theme was Make Waves, if you haven't been able to figure that out this morning with all the decorations around. We learned about God and Jesus and the, how God's Spirit can make a difference in each of us. And how um, one of the big points that we made is God can help us change the world around us, and that's truly how we make waves. So during the week, our children traveled to different activities. We started off by singing and playing some games in here. They went to a Bible story, crafts. We did um, a games rotation. One of the favorite ki things that the kids will tell you that they did was snack every day. We had snack. We also collected items for outreach. We collected almost 100 travel size shampoos, body lotions, and um, body wash so that they can use them at their facility. So I couldn't have done this. We couldn't have done this with a lot of help. We had people volunteer during the week. People took stuff home to cut things out for me. People bought supplies. We had folks provide dinner for our volunteers. So if you helped at all with VBS, if you could please stand up. Oh, come on, don't be shy. There's a lot of you. Give them a round of applause. We had people subbing for subs by the end of the week. So thank you all very, very, very much. So right now, we would like to share a song with you that we did with VBS. I want everyone to stand up and participate, not just the kids, everybody. And I want everyone to step and clap. Can you step, clap? That's one move that we will do. And then making waves. You know half of the song now, all right? Any volunteers that want to come up and help are welcome as well.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all.
just our voices worthy of it all. And God, we thank you this morning that you are worthy of it all. God, we love you, and, and we, we recognize that you're the only one who is worthy of our praise. So God, we sing it out loud this morning. We love you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So we reference the scripture that the prayers of the saints are like a sweet-smelling incense. I pray that often, actually. So it's fun to have a song that actually connects those two ideas, that the prayers of what we do here would rise up to God and He would breathe it in. Amen. It's good to have you all here this morning. I'm going to take a quick minute here and bring this up. I figured it was probably not a good idea to have this up here while the kids were dancing, but I'll pull it up now. Um, Let's go ahead and take a quick minute just to dismiss our students, kids, to their um, appropriate classes right now. Y'all have a good time. All right, we'll see y'all afterwards for ice cream at the Ice Cream Social. I just wanted to say one more time thank you to Jody and all of you who helped out. I know there's a lot of us here helping to make sure that this got put together and decorations were up and leading the kids. I had a blast working with the, um, the younger kids and being able to, to uh, hang out with them and give a lot of high fives and learn some awesome dances that I never knew a week ago. So it was a blast uh, for everyone here. Um, As we jump into the series, we're continuing a series on the book of James that we started last week, so it's still pretty early on. Um, And uh, one of the things I wanted us to see here is as the, um, uh, there's like a character in James that we're dealing with. As he wrote this letter to a group of people who were exiled, who were scattered about in a specific region, um, what he wants us to understand is that there are some things and ways in which we should um, live our life. And so what we wanted to recognize early on is that as humans, none of us like to be told what to do, right? No one wants to have rules for you to abide. And what James did is like, hey, I love you. You're awesome. Rule number one. Then he goes on and does rule number two. And the idea here is that for us, rules are always equated with bad, but in a Jewish context, that wasn't always true. In fact, I kind of tried to liken it. Have you ever been to a family gathering or barbecue and like you got that aunt or that uncle that starts in, well, you know what your problem is. Or like, hey, you know what you should do is, and you're just like, ah, man, like, uncle, not now, man. I don't need to hear all of your life's advice here inside of this moment. Why? Because we want to be in control. We want to think that we have agency over everything we do, that we don't need any outside perspectives in the midst of us doing the things that we want to do. We want to have uh, and be able to do anything and everything that we want to do. But James, in this moment, right, the, the letter writer of this is just harnessing the biggest uncle energy you've ever had in your life and just coming in with that authority and saying, I've got some things that I think you're going to need to hear, some things that you're going to need to understand. So J- James writes this letter to them. And what we find is that there's a lot of wisdom, a lot inside of that. And what we understand from the Jewish people is that they had this twist on the idea, they had this category of their own for rules that we would sometimes call through wisdom literature Proverbs. And so James is literally just his best Proverbs, where he gives a one-liner, tells you what he wants you to know, then he fleshes it out somehow, and then often that will look like a little rabbit trail, and then he'll come back to it at the end and really hit home what he's trying to say. And there's about 11 or 12 of those Proverbs inside of this book, and then he signs off. He's done. He said everything that he needed to do inside of that. I want to give you one perspective. Christina Conti is a minister. She's part of the Salvation Army. And she wrote an article that was published in, it's a commentary called the Global Bible Study, um, or the Global Bible Commentary that we use pretty often here. It says this, the book of James is the only work of wisdom literature in the New Testament. The author is especially concerned for social justice and also for the ethical and practical issues of the Christian life. He is clearly on the side of the poor, the marginalized, and the powerless, as Jesus was, a point James emphasized with the structure of his book, 
um, uh, is, is that he built into this, these Proverbs, there's actually what they call a chiasm, meaning it builds towards something at the center and then kind of climbs back out. And at the center of that chiasm is what you find to be the focus of this book, why he wrote it, and is very social justice oriented. And so as we were kind of coming into this time of, man, we hit a lot of social justice topics. I'll be 100% honest with you, transparent. That's something that we are so about that I'm like, man, we could be getting some topic fatigue. I'm going to just pick a book of the Bible, teach through that, and it'll be something completely fresh, completely different. Well, James had something different to say. It's like, nope, we're going to talk about social justice. So I want you to understand that my heart in that was kind of this diversification of the things that we tend to talk about. But what you realize over and over, the more you deal in justice and reconciliation issues, the more you realize you just can't get away from it. Like there were points that I had to decide, like, how do I teach people where this is at in the scriptures? And now I don't know where it's not at. All right? It's in every single thing. And so you're going to hear more of that. You're also going to know, like we talked about last week, that, that James comes from a socioeconomically disadvantaged situation. When we hear about Mary and how she's saying of the poor and all these different things, these are parts that are, that are just a part of what it is. And the Jews, as they were interacting with wisdom literature, said in Psalm 19 that we read last week, it's perfect. The precepts are exactly what we need to help us in life. In fact, it compares it to honey, that it's like sweet, a delicious thing that I want to crave. I want to crave wisdom. I want to crave and consume it so that it would be well with me and I would live long forever. And so part of the the job of this is as we engage with the book of James is for us to understand we have an orientation that does not want to be told what to do and we have to surrender our hearts, our minds, our souls to see what Uncle James has to say for us. Because it just might be something we need to hear. It might be something on the other side. You're like, that really was sweet honey. And I want more of that. So I want to start off today, just a quick little interactive thing. We used to do this during COVID every Sunday. um, But I want to give you a question and ask you to ask some neighbors around you the answer to this question. All right, we'll give like about a minute for that. And I'll reel it all back in. But what is a great piece of advice that you've received? Somewhere at some point along the time that you have lived, you receive something that resonated with you and you still have it. It could be a one-liner. It could be a common known proverb that you've heard that's just out there. Um, or it could be something that was very unique to you. But what I want to do is give you a minute. Tell someone around you. Ask the question. Say, hey, what is a piece of wisdom that you heard along the way and that you embrace today? So I'll give you one minute to do that. Talk amongst yourselves. Then ask the question back and forth so you can hear a little bit. So do that now. All right, don't be selfish with it. Make sure you ask one piece of wisdom. Well, I'm sure you've got something to share and to kind of say as we, as we bring it back in. There's some kind of obvious ones that we have, right? Like a penny saved is what? A penny earned, right? When life gives you lemons, make what? Yep, and my personal favorite, don't eat the yellow snow. (laughs) I didn't have to learn that lesson in Phoenix. I had to learn that lesson here, though, right? You don't want to mess with that yellow snow, and that's an important thing we passed on to our kids. As we think about the wisdom that we've embraced, what I want us to do, again, is just to give our hearts, our minds submitted to James in this moment and make the assumption that he may have something good for us to hear. And so the defensiveness needs to be put to the side. We need to engage this text understanding um, that he has something, his best material even possibly is what some people say. Like even some people say his, his 11 best sermons summarized into a paragraph each. 
And so we're going to jump into that second one today. Um, again, like last week, it's going to start, and it's going to seem like it takes a completely like turn that makes no sense, unrelated, and then it's going to come back, and I'll try to reveal that and surface it as we talk. But let's read this together. James 1, we're going to start in verse um, 18 and um, read up until about 21. We got the, lyric, or the words up there, perfect. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to what? Slow to what? And slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. And I've said this before, but at times, don't you read this and you're like, man, I bet James was a lot of fun at a party (laughs) coming at us like this. But look, again, he's got something that's important for us to say. Even as we read that first part, that's pretty good advice right off the bat. Be slow to speak, slow to get angry, right? We want to be quick in order to, to, to be um, uh, forgivers. And I think most of us will hear this. Most of us will grab this and say, man, this is solid, solid wisdom. There's only one problem. We don't like to do that, Right? We don't like to listen to the advice that sometimes we understand is even what's best. It's wisdom we don't like to hear. Many of us want to have strong opinions and just throw those things out there. We want to be free to just jump to conclusions, to be petty at times. Right? Is it just me? Like, that's a, that's a real thing. At times, you just want to jump into it, embrace a knee-jerk reaction, be offended, indulge anger. One of the things that's true about anger is when you're there, you, like, you don't want someone to cheer you up, pull you out of that. You want to stay in your anger, right? So James tells us, hey, man, take a deep breath. Calm down. That's a part of this, right? Put some space between you and the thing that you're about to do. And he isn't just coming up with this off the top of his head. He is basically, almost literally, quoting from multiple Proverbs and pieces from the Old Testament, which have two things that I think are important for us to know. One is just the tendency, right? The, like the general proverb, sin, this is, this is coming from 1019, Proverb 1019. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but in the prudent hold of your tongue. All right? Proverbs 15, 1 and 2, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of a fool gushes with folly. So there's that general principle that we have in mind, but I also want to read you this section from Ecclesiastes because our tongue can get us in trouble in another way. It says this, guard your steps when you go down into the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do is wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. I'm reading this to you, by the way, too. This wasn't supposed to be up there. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few Then he goes on to say, a dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. So anything that comes into your imagination, you just start speaking of it, is the mark of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow at all than to make one not to fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Make excuses. Justify it. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. And so what, what we have is this twofold idea. Like, we can get ourselves into trouble just by speaking. We can also get ourselves into trouble by over-promising, making vows, saying I'm going to do something and not doing it. And both of those are assumed as James is making these quotes. That as you hear this, you're going you're gonna, to um, have this hyperlink immediately as a Jewish person when he says it to go back to these Proverbs and to understand the ancient wisdom literature that he is referencing. And so James is reminding them, not bringing up something new, of ancient wisdom that they probably heard, they've maybe memorized, they're very familiar with, and that things that come out of their mouths, um, uh, he's going to take and, and expound on in chapter 3, we'll come back to that. So I'm not going to go too far into that, but to understand that our tongue has a lot more power than we might think. Here it implies hurtful speech and promises and vows that you cannot keep. But listen, because there's something that happens at the end. He's also helping them to understand very specifically how this all ties into the fabric of the world that we live in. 
He's not just talking about independent mouthing off at some point. He's really wanting them to understand that the world has its own set of traditions, that the world has its own ways of wisdom, its own codes of conduct. And so he says it like this, because human anger, this is what we've already read, that word translated means wrath, because wrath does not produce the righteousness, that word is justice. So let me reread that again. Human wrath does not produce justice or righteousness that God desires. And so he's like, don't buy into these other solutions. This is what the world does to solve things. I don't want you to buy into those solutions. And then he names some solutions in the next part. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, not just the tongue and not just speech and not just vows that you can't keep, all moral filth, the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. So catch the contrast. This isn't just mouth, this isn't just speech, this isn't just vows, but it's tying into an entire framework of a way of life that is not what God is asking them to do. So get rid of those things, that's the world, they are not going to accomplish the things that you want. What I want you to do instead is to accept the word planted in you which can save you. And ultimately James is giving us an invitation. He's inviting us all, the exiled Jews who he's writing to, but you and I right now, into this kind of counter-formation that is contrary to other things we've been told, an alternative type of discipleship that will often fly in the face of what the world and conventional wisdom that the world is trying to get us to buy into relentlessly even at times. And so logically what James wants them to understand is there are two wells you could draw from. There are two paths you could walk down. There are two ways in which you can decide to live your life. Not that different from the very first part, right? He said there's a formula that leads to life and there's a formula that leads to death. And so he's representing to us in this moment, again, a decision that invites you into a counter formation that James is wanting to logically get us to understand will not produce what God wants. Catch this, if that's what you want, right? If that's what you want, this is not the way to get it. And so there's a logical process here, right? Like, like basically, two wrongs don't make a right. So don't buy into that. Then James goes on to explain how one can receive and even cultivate that seed of the Word of God planted in them in, inside of their lives. Verse 22 goes on with this. It says, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror and after looking at, him, at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now you probably guessed it already. With the kids dancing, I didn't want to have glass up here. And I had something written on there. Sorry, I forgot to clean it off. I was experimenting with some other ideas. So you can hate me for my lack of clean, clean mirrors. But... This is what I want you to see. He's got this analogy. And did you see what James did? Before he gives this, this analogy for them, what he wants to hear, what he wants to get them across is that um, he anticipates that you are going to agree with what he says, but then you will not follow through. Is that a safe assumption? He anticipates, he predicts, everyone is going to hear this piece of wisdom and say, amen. We should keep our, our mouths shut probably a little bit more often but then your ownership of actually doing that is going to just go right through your fingers like sand. And he knows it. This is the reality of what he's dealing in. And so have you, listen, listen to me, have you ever agreed with something before, but your actions didn't actually back up what you were saying? Like, somebody should do the dishes. <laughs> I agree with that. But until you get up and do those dishes... You haven't owned that. Like, like, I guess I could probably lose a couple of pounds, but dang, them tater tots look good. Do you see how it goes? Like, you, you have all the time, like, this is just everyday examples. All the time we are making decisions where we agree with something, but we don't actually own it. We don't put actions to those things. And until you actually put those things into action, they don't exist. They are not reality. So James is making sure that they understand, that he understands there is a chasm between what they are going to agree with and what they will actually do or what will be put into action. So in order for something to exist, this is our formula. Agreement plus action. Otherwise, it's just not real. 
It doesn't happen. It's not reality. And James says that believing anything else is foolishness. He says it's so foolish, in fact, it's like looking into a mirror and walking away and forgetting about what you see. I want to read that together moving into this next section. It says, anyone who listens to the Word of God but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at it himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So let's sit in this metaphor for just a little bit. I think it tracks today. Most of us, if not all of us, looked into a mirror probably today, this morning, right? And it shows. Y'all look good. I can tell that you groomed properly before coming to Sunday gathering, right? When you look inside of this mirror, what does it do? It gives you the reality. It doesn't change it, right? Unless there's something added to this, it doesn't change anything. It just tells me what is the reality of what I look like and the reality of what's going on on the other side. So if I look in here and someone makes a crazy face at me, I'm going to know that. It's not, it's not changing anything. You have a warped mirror possibly, but that's not what he's referring to. This is a truth kind of mirror. And so what he's doing here is that the reality of the situation is that you have seen some flaws. Your hair is crazy. You got bedhead because you woke up. Maybe you missed a spot shaving and, you, oh man, I, I'm going to have to reshave. Perhaps you have rogue hairs that need to be trimmed or tamed food on yourself because you just had a meal and you realize that there's a piece of corn hanging out on your chin. Or perhaps you've been playing outside and there's dirt smudges all over you. Like, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say to you to my, that when I talk to my son, Ezekiel, go look in the mirror, you need to wash your face, and he comes back and nothing has changed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a proverb, man. <laughs> you're, the, you're the living example of this proverb. And so getting ready for this, I even did this little Jesus challenge um, with James with our kids, uh, which essentially was me just having them read each chunk, and the older ones wrote, wrote something, and the little ones, we just folded up pieces of paper, just plain white paper. I didn't have very many tools, so I poked holes with scissors, tied it together with a piece of floss. I mean, super, super uh, creative situation here, and I had them draw pictures. And so in this moment, I said to my kids, go look at a mirror. Tell me everything that you see. So they run over to the mirror. The little ones were all excited about this. And uh, they, they said, I have two eyes. I've got a nose. I've got a mouth. Right? And they come back and tell me everything that every human typically has. I said, how many freckles do you have? Oh, I don't know. Well, go back and look at the freckles. He looks at all the freckles. Well, how, how about, how, how, how is uh, this, like you got like a, a little smudge over here. Did you notice that? And he's like, no. It was like, oh, I didn't know that. So he's looking around and he realized even with one quick glance in the mirror, he had not memorized his own face. And so there's all kinds of ways in which this analogy can be applied to us. To see it and to do nothing with what we see is foolishness. And so this mirror, as James says, is the perfect law that gives freedom. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what does that mean? We've talked already. We don't like laws. In fact, nobody's driving down the freeway and saying, thank you for a 25 mile an hour speed limit because it makes sure that I'm safe and that nobody gets hurt on the side of the road. You get mad at it. But it's a different kind of law, right? Well, he's directly referring to Torah. Torah is the, the first five books of the scripture, but could also just be in general a term for the Old Testament, which is what I think James is doing here. And there's all kinds of laws and ways of life and the stories of the way in which the Jewish people have lived, all of which they believe were useful for showing them how they are to live and the best possible way of living on the earth according to Yahweh's precepts. But they also reveal how bad you are at it. That's the problem with the law. It informed me. It told me, oh, I shouldn't pay back evil for evil. But then when you realize you've done that, I've paid evil for evil, you look in the mirror of the Torah, the truth of who God has revealed himself to be, and you realize, like, man, I'm really bad at doing that. I need to make some adjustments. I need to make some changes. And so because we were so bad, a sacrifice was needed in Jesus who then became both the living example of what it looks like for us to live according to the law and he became the final sacrifice to shore up our shortcomings in the midst of that. He completed the law. And the reason I wanted you to see that is because it's a little different than what we think of as law today, but it also changes your perspective because our relationship was changed when Jesus died on the cross, when he rose again, when he lived the way that he did so that he could show us. Because what it does, I want to quote from a Messianic Jew. His name is um, Rabbi Liechtenstein. 
He said the Messiah perfected the law. Since the Lord said that he came to make the Torah complete, it means that the believer in Yeshua no longer serves God like a slave out of fear, but a son or daughter serving their heavenly father out of love. The spirit of the Messiah freed him and gave him a new spirit. Now, the Jewish New Testament commentary, which you hear me talk about a lot, was where I got this from, but they go on to kind of agree with Liechtenstein. It says, some Christians then misuse this verse as well as Romans 7.3, and they say that we're just freed from the law, by which they mean free from the supposedly oppressive rules and regulations prescribed by Jews by the Torah of Moses. But actually, the situation is precisely the opposite. It is the Torah which, because it is perfect, gives us freedom. How many of us can say amen to that? I mean, kind of, right? It's harder. Even as we look into it, it says this only rebellious, um, uh, uh, that words, it says antinomians, um, law, law followers, I'll say it there. Re- only rebellious law followers seek to be, uh, sorry, uh, l- l- you usually when people use this language, there's like legalism on one side and license to just do whatever you want. Does that make sense? And so if you're living in a world that gives you those two things, you seek to be free from the rules and regulations, the wise understand that only within this framework of the law that true freedom is possible. Okay. So generally, we can apply this term to Scripture. Like there's a freedom. They didn't have the New Testament at that time, but now we do. So we have the, the Torah. We have the, uh, all of the writings in the middle. We have the wisdom literature. And then we have the New Testament with letters and the stories of Jesus who tells us exactly how it is that we are supposed to live. And what I wanted you to see and what I had written on here before, and I was, had these great plans of having a marker up here and just write the word truth. The mirror in our metaphor, if you could see it in giant big words, and then you could see I had a little Bible drawn here. It was really awesome. I'm sure you could trust me in that. But imagine the word truth is just written across this mirror because that's what our metaphor is. The truth, the reality is reflected back onto us as we engage any bit of the canonized scripture. Okay? So as we're reading this, as we're going through it, as we're asking James to pour into our life, the Bible is this living word. It's the only book that when we read it, it's actually reading us back. It's telling us things about ourselves, and it reveals to us the what and how we should live according to the Creator's design, and then we have adjustments that we can make on the other side if, and maybe that's a big if, if you're committed to owning and acting upon what is revealed. And so here, James, generally, he's just making them aware they can't keep raising their awareness of the law and understanding how it is that they are supposed to live without taking ownership of that truth. And he's trying to make them understand, you know how ridiculous that is. If you just leave something crazy, your hair is not looking good, you just like, you saw it and you're like, ah, you know, eh, they can deal with it. They can deal with all of this, whatever situation I happen to have going on here. So that's, that's ridiculous. So there's a responsibility attached to the truth that we understand. And the proverb here is going to give us not only that reminder, but a very sharp example that's specific to what they're dealing with. So verse 26, and we'll finish out. It says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue, he ties it back into the tongue, right? And deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. So if you do this and you don't actually listen, if you don't heed it, if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue, you not only deceive yourself, but your religion is worthless. Here's the example. Religion that, our God, that, the, that God our Father accepts as pure and as faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. And so this section is about obedience, and it's got these characteristics in here that we want to look at, whose religion is pure and undefiled, who keeps their tongue according to what God has said in check, Um, and all of this is being pulled from these Old Testament um, understandings of how it is that we are supposed to live, and he refuses uh, self-deception. He, he says we should bridle our tongue, meaning we keep a tight rein on our speech like a bridle controlling a horse. He shows mercy and love to the oppressed, uh, 
This, again, is pulling from another tradition that we've talked about over and over and over again here at Common Ground Northeast, because he just gave two of what are four in the Old Testament, a group of people we would call the quartet of the oppressed, the quartet of, of those, um, and, and the two that are missing here, we have orphans, widows, we have refugees. What am I missing? Does anyone remember? I'm just forgetting off the top of my head. Children. So there are some who are the, the most vulnerable in society, and the quartet of the vulnerable is being referenced very specifically by James in this moment. So if you don't do these things, then you're, I mean, you're basically worthless inside of your religious devotion because this particular group of people is always the ones who need help inside. I want to remind you over and over again, not bridling your tongue is as worthless as just starting fires. Not helping the, the hurting the, the poor and the oppressed is basically you just not doing anything that we said. It's very simple inside of his thing. And every time we approach a mirror, we're supposed to understand that there is an attachment, that there are ways in which we are supposed to live that include not just the private understanding of dealing with our tongue, but our public understanding of how we take care of people. They both proclaim things to others around us. And so if we don't do this, Someone can easily look at us and say, you don't even believe your own religious convictions. They speak on our behalf. And then he ends this by saying that we remain unstained from the world because he's including all of these things together as a part of the law. James uses sacrificial language of the lamb without blemish. He's trying to get us to understand that Jesus died as a sacrifice, but there are still some things that we're supposed to do. Remember, he's talking directly to Jewish people, right? And so whether you want to pick one thing over the other, your tongue over this, your your, uh, whether or not I um, I give preferences to people, which is what next week is going to talk about, whether or not I decide to be a part of taking care of the poor, all of the things in which uh, that that we do that we live are proclaiming something about what we believe and how we interact with the law. And I think what I want us to do here as we end is to think about this mere idea. Revisit this because I think there's a few ways in which we can engage this mirror. That we read something in here, whether it's a giant social justice theme or whether it is just keeping the peace in your home because you're bridling your tongue, and we might walk away and just completely ignore what we've heard. Right? There's a few different postures we can have. He said you walk away and forget because, I don't know, maybe you just don't care about the end result. I'm not going to make any adjustments when the scriptures tell me I'm not doing what I should be doing because, I don't know, like, maybe I'm just not sold on the goal. Maybe I'm just not sold that I'm supposed to be going down. I'm going to downplay this adjustment because, man, I really wish I could keep doing that. And now I know it's sin, but I'm just going to kind of ignore it. Maybe it's just a surrendering of rights, not sins. Just liberties that God has said you're okay to walk in, but now he's saying it's a season of letting that thing go. Do you want me? Am I better than the thing you have become attached to? And so there's, for us, a time where we want to maybe step back and look in the mirror ourselves, take stock of our public and our private understanding, and say, am I ignoring something? Have I been raised in my awareness that something I'm doing is sin or is not fulfilling what the law has required of me? And, and just ignoring it because I simply just don't want to do it. And so I would say to you, confront that in yourself. Don't ignore what you've seen. Because it's like seeing something on you and walking away and just saying, ah, I don't care. What if you, and James is assuming, right, that we have this desire to please God, that we have a desire to go after the end goal that God is, um, has required from us. And so what if we go in, we become spiritually mature um, in terms of that's, that being our goal, this, this goal out here of spiritual maturity, and then all of a sudden I'm just like, you know what, I just don't care about being spiritually mature. And so if you are in that position, you're looking at this mirror and you're like, yeah, I, just, I guess the goal for me is not to be fixed up or not to make any adjustments in my life. I've been raised in my awareness, but I just don't, I, I guess I just don't think maturity is the thing that I'm after. And so I would say there's a different evaluation of your heart. You're not ignoring it because you want to hold on to something. You're just not convinced that the goal is something that you want to chase after. And so do you, as a follower of Christ, want what Christ wants for your life? We could always just never look in the mirror again. If when I look in this mirror, I see things that I don't like, I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to cover that up. (laughs) 
I don't want to see what's... And so your scriptures look like this, closed, gaining dust, and set on a shelf somewhere. I, I just, I can't do it. I don't want to do it anymore. And I would say for you, maybe take the risk that this might be better for you. Maybe take the risk that Uncle James has some good things to say, and he's not just always throw, pointing fingers and trying to ask you to make changes in your life. And so take the veil off of the mirror. Pick up the truth of the scriptures and begin reading, listening, interacting in community. You can deny it. You can say, I don't trust the mirror itself anymore. So whatever this says, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or if it's not true. I, I just don't, um, I'm going to refuse to embrace what I just read. And that's a possibility. You could go in that route. And what I want to challenge you to this day is to understand that there's a possibility that there are things you can know from ancient literature that you have not considered. So read it. Put it to the test. Try it out and see what happens inside of your life. See what good might come from that. But try to begin trusting, praying as I prayed, because many of you know I didn't grow up in a Christian household, but there is a season where I'm like, God, if you're real, reveal yourself. And I prayed that over and over and over and over until I had something that I felt like was irrefutable in my life, both experientially and um, you know, kind of from an academic standpoint. And so you could just deny it and stop reading, learning, stop building your relationship to, with God. And maybe you see a flaw in the mirror and, and this one's a little deeper. Maybe you see a flaw in the mirror and there's a part of you that understands that that's actually very deeply rooted to something that happened to me in my past. That's a, that's a, that comes from my family of origin. That comes from my home life. That comes from a trauma that happened. In fact, I'm not, I, I look in the mirror and I realize I've got masks on that I put in there so people don't know who I am. And so there's another uh, essence of trying to find a way to begin trusting God. Say, God, why do I have this mask on? Why am I pretending? What is it that needs to be healed or solved or, or dealt with? What foothold have I given to the enemy that needs to be removed and thrown out inside of that God? And have I resorted to it because of something that hurt me in the past? And I would say, talk to Jenny, um, uh, Elder Jenny, um, here, uh, she has a trauma and healing course um, that, she, that she operates, a ministry here. And I would say, Jenny, if you want to just raise your hand here right now, you can see who she is. Just go talk to her. And she has an incredible ministry to help you resolve these things. But I'm going to say, those are harder to deal with, aren't they? It's like I read this, and I've been taught for so long that that's the way it should go, and the scriptures are telling me no. Or, or I, I've been holding on to that for survival because I'm not going to be able to make it in this world if I don't build up a calloused heart towards the things around me. And the scriptures are like, soften your heart, please. I want to give you a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. And so sometimes the scriptures reveal that there's things that are deeper in us. And I want to pray with you for those things. And I'm going to ask that God would release you for that. But understand that at times the scriptures will reveal those things. And you're going to have to do some heart work if you want to grow in your maturity and to walk towards wholeness in Christ. Well, this, is, this is how I want us to end here today before we get out and uh, grab some ice cream together. Um, I want to pray over us and ask the Lord to begin to heal certain things and to reveal certain things to us, but that he would not just convict us, but as our values state, we want to be a courageous people. And so I'm going to ask that God gives us the courage to do whatever it is that he's telling us to do. This is a prayer that I've been praying for a long time, and I want to just publicly proclaim that over us, that we would have both conviction and courage as a church to be people of the word, but also indeed as well in the midst of these things, and to boldly go before the scriptures and say, Lord, adjust me if I need adjusting. Help me to be a, a person of wisdom in other people's lives in community and that as we go out in mission together, we would be whole people ready to heal and make others whole, not hurting, not those who are unwilling to make changes, not those who are, lack the courage to follow through with conviction, not those who would look into a mirror and not remember what, just, what they just saw. Would you pray with me? And so God, today we come to you understanding um, a simple truth and a metaphor that we maybe see every single day of our lives. 
And so, Lord, would you allow every mirror we see moving forward, every bathroom we walk into, any decorative mirror that we have passed by and say, that's right. Being a follower of Christ means seeing things that are true about us and doing something about it and not walking away from the mirror as if we didn't see anything. We don't want to be hearers, Lord. We want to be doers. I also don't want to just be doers who go about doing things without being informed by your scriptures. So we need to be hearers as well, Father. So make us both of those things. Let us flex both of those muscles today. And whether we come before the mirror, Lord, and we want to forget or we intentionally ignore or we might cover up the mirror because we don't want to deal with it or we, fought, we, we uh, flee away from the things that you reveal because it just hurts too much, heal those things. And so even today, Lord, I see um, wounds being bound up in my mind's imagination. Even today, I see strongholds like, like uh, rocks on a cleft that are breaking and crumbling so the enemy can't climb those. Let us see that true freedom comes in obedience to you, God. Not being freed from you, but understanding that we get to come before you as sons and daughters, excited to love you in the way that you have told us we are supposed to love you, love each other, and love the world around us. So whatever hesitation, God, would you allow that to be dissolved? Whatever pains, would you allow those things to be healed? Whatever sins or things we're holding on to because we're somehow buying the lie that it's better than you, reveal yourself as ultimate. And Father, would you allow our defensiveness to drop, that we would put feet to the things you have told us to do, that the world would know it, that we would have a unified community within, and that we would proclaim you not just with the things we say, but in the deeds that we perform, God. Thank you, Lord, and we ask for all of these things right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Well, as we move forward in our service, we're going to jump into our response time um, today. And um, we do that, as we say, four ways. We sing, we give, we pray, and we remember. And so we're going to lift our voices once again in response to the truth. I pray this truth all the time um, over us that we wouldn't encounter the Word of God and be the same on the other side. And so that's my prayer for us today. If you have a, um, a conviction and the ability to give, um, we would love to invite you to do that. You can do that in person behind us um, as you leave the door. There's a box that you can um, give your tithes and offerings, and then you can always do that online. Um, follow the little QR code on the seat back in front of you for those instructions. Um, if you have anything that you would like specifically to be prayed over, please feel free to come to one of, to one of us as leaders or um, uh, one of the elders here uh, at Common Ground Northeast. We would love to pray over you and anything that you're dealing with. And then, of course, we remember. If you haven't grabbed your elements um, from the back on the, uh, the two different trays that are available, you can feel free to grab the little cup and cracker pack that's there uh, right now. And we want to come together under the banner of Jesus Christ who unifies us and makes us one as we commune together, who helps us to be a people to put this into action, to see the things that God wants us to do and to be those who are willing to go through with it. Let me read to you from Matthew as a part of our communion scripture reading. It says this, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And once again, the reminder, we anchor ourselves in the Passover moment that God died, but then he points us to this future banquet in heaven and earth when we will drink and feast at the communion table with every tribe, tongue, and nation together in unity. After a moment of reflection, please feel free to eat of the bread and drink of the juice. The table is open.
join in when you're ready. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of the sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Yes. Amen. Was as we go out today, would you be commissioned um, knowing the fullness of the grace of Jesus Christ, the friendship of Jesus as uh, you go today, um, but also know that as we come with our hearts and our minds to the Scripture and allow them to read over us, that we should put action and ownership to the things that God has told us to do and that our communities, ourselves, and our society would be better because of that. Go now knowing all of these things and take them everywhere you go, into all the places that you work, into your neighborhoods, and everywhere you step. The kingdom of heaven, the church of God has stepped there. Believe that. And do this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Y'all have a great one. Oh, directions. I believe all of the stuff is happening outside, right? Is that true? I think all of it.